Hello. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Father Nick Dant, uh, pastor of uh, St. Matthew's Parish. I would think most of you know me by now. I've, I've um, uh, uh, done some of these before. Uh, that was last year's class. Um, but uh, I think you've seen me before. I, I, I was, um, I, <clears throat> I think I did an enrollment right or uh, with all of you uh, at some at some point in this process of your preparation uh, for um, uh, uh, for uh, the sacrament of confirmation. But to, the, what we're going to talk about with this uh, session is is two things. One, the Nicene Creed. Two, the four marks of the church. And we'll talk about the creed first because of the fact that. Uh, 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 it lists the four marks of the church uh, in the creed, and I thought that just seemed rather logical to talk about the creed first and then proceed into those elements that it talks about. Uh, the four marks are named at the very uh, third section of the creed. It's kind of in three different sections with the Father, the Son, and then the Holy Spirit, and we confess that we uh, believe in the church, the Holy Spirit and the church at, at that third section. Um, a, thing I've had, a thing I think we need to keep in mind is that uh, uh, the creeds um, are uh, the way church expresses and hands on its faith. Uh, and the church has had creeds since its earliest days going all the way back uh, uh, at least to the latter part of the first century, and Christianity began around the year 33 after Jesus died and rose from the dead. And then as the time went on, they got closer to the end of that first century. Christians has felt a need that we have to uh, have some kind of way to be able to express our faith and, and, and to kind of name that faith, what we believe in, especially when we bring new people into the church and we help form them in the faith and so we know uh, that uh, uh, what we're handing on to them uh, in the uh, in and when we when we form these people in the faith when they uh, bring new people into the church uh, this process to do today we call the RCIA process the rite of Christian initiation of adults and the way we teach adults today is basically. Uh, uh, um, uh, constructed out of out of um, out of those articles of faith that we believe in that we named in the creed. In the earliest days of the church, they had several uh, different communities, different churches throughout the eastern part of the Roman Empire where the church began. Each community or an area with several communities might form a creed uh, or have a list of beliefs that uh, they would have. Uh, the uh, uh, candidates ready to profess as they get ready to baptize. And so there were different creeds. The most ancient one we have that's still extant, that means still that we use, uh, is the Apostles' Creed. Um, the Apostles' Creed uh, goes back at least to, to uh, the second century. Uh, and it was, a, it was formed as a baptismal creed to be professed by people before they were baptized, uh, mainly adults in those days, because the church was still getting off the ground, and, and many, many converts were coming over to the church from paganism, and, and uh, uh, the, what we now, as I say, call the RCIA process, uh, would have been a major focus of the church, of the early church, and, and trying to establish and get the church uh, a solid foundation and get off the ground. Um, so they would use the Apostles' Creed as their baptismal creed, which basically lists those 12 articles of faith that we, uh, that we believe as, as Christians. And uh, uh, I think... Uh, uh, when we talk about beliefs, when we, um, and we mean our own creed, whether it be the Apostles' Creed 
or what we now call the Nicene Creed. And I'll say a few words about the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed you're familiar with because we profess it every Sunday uh, when we celebrate Mass. Now, during the Lent season of Lent and Easter, we may, uh, uh, some parishes, they're allowed to, the church encourages it that we use the Apostles' Creed during Lent and Easter because our focus is on baptism and bringing new people into the church at the Easter vigil. Uh, and since the Apostles' Creed is considered the baptismal creed, as I said, of the early church, the church says uh, uh, it'd be a good idea for us during this season to recite that creed instead of the Nicene Creed at Mass. And a lot of parishes do this. You do not have to, uh, a parish does not have to use the Apostles' Creed. You can always use the Nicene Creed. Uh, but the church wants us to be aware of our roots. Uh, the Nicene Creed uh, when I get into it, is basically an elaboration um, on a more detailed scale about our uh, those twelve articles of belief that we have in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, they are, in a certain sense, explained more and delineated more. Um, but I think we have to realize that beliefs are uh, can be foundational. And beliefs can be, have change over time when we're talking about two different styles of belief. By foundational beliefs, uh, we mean those beliefs that uh, uh, we consider to be true foundational of our life and those things that we hold to give us solidity uh, in, in our life uh, that we stand upon. Things like, I believe in God. Uh, that belief is not going to change. I believe my family loves me. Uh, those are foundational beliefs. I believe in the idea of love. I believe love is true. These are foundational beliefs. Uh, it would take a lot to change them. They take it, it would probably take some traumatic experience in our life to change these beliefs. That my family doesn't love me, or I don't believe in love as a reality, or I don't even believe in God. But other, other beliefs are less foundational uh, and, and it can change over times uh, depending upon the information we have. Or we might look at those beliefs in a different way. For instance, belief in Santa Claus. I'm sure most of you uh, believed uh, uh, when you were kids in the idea of Santa Claus. Now, when you got older, it's not so much that we drop the belief, but that we gain more information. We have different insights to that belief and understand the idea of Santa Claus in a much broader perspective. You know, we believe in the spirit of what this Santa Claus figure represents, and not know that he's a a, a, a particular person uh, who lives at the North Pole and, and drives on. Uh, in a sleigh on 12 reindeer, bringing, bringing gifts all over the world on Christmas. But that idea does have root in reality uh, with the uh, Saint Nicholas, uh, who the figure is based upon, uh, who was representative uh, in a very real way of how to live out the Christian life in terms of being giving, generous, and loving of others. And uh, uh, that belief will go on uh, as foundational belief, that belief in, in generosity, uh, being loving for and and uh, and uh, sharing all that that Santa Claus figure represents. Uh, also, uh, our beliefs uh, uh, allow us to define what is true. What we, as I said, the foundational beliefs, what we believe to be true, what we believe the foundation of our lives gives our life meaning, gives our life existence. But our beliefs can be can be shaken if we aren't careful um, or can be shaken because of whatever experiences that we have that may be uh, uh, give us some uh, cause to rethink the belief, the foundational belief, or, or try to understand it in a different way. For instance, a heated argument about the existence of God with someone who's convinced that God does not exist uh, may cause us to uh, question our own belief about God, and that's not necessarily bad. What If it leads us to seek further knowledge, uh, to seek further understanding about our own belief, why I believe God exists, then uh, a challenge can be a good thing. Uh, the challenge can always, to our beliefs, can always help us to have a much broader perspective 
on what we do believe. If we seek to understand it in a deeper way, uh, we seek to have more knowledge about that belief. We try to ask ourselves questions. Why do I believe this? Why do I believe this with the rest of the believers who believe the same way I do? For instance, a church, you know, uh, that can all be good uh, for us. It helps us deepen our beliefs. Um, beliefs on, on, um, uh, are on the, um, on the broader or are on the, the broader level or the corporate level, uh, the community level, let's put it that way. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, companies have statements of belief. We call these uh, uh, mission statements. Parishes have mission statements. We have a mission statement here at St. Matthew's. Uh, you have a mission, there's a mission statement for St. Lawrence. Uh, these mission statements define what we hold to be true about ourselves as as a Christian community, we as, as a parish mission statement. And, but sometimes these parish mission statements need to be, uh, need to be refined, defined more, so that as, as, as we go along and we grow as a community, become uh, uh, somewhat different maybe as a community, as we live out our faith, as we try to be a, a parish, uh, we sometimes have to become more specific about our beliefs. This is kind of what happened with the development of the Apostles' Creed finally into the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed does not deny anything that's in the Apostles' Creed. It just elaborates it more and uh, uh, gives it uh, a more specific definition about what we believe uh, in, in as Christians. Um, okay, so we talked about uh, the need uh, that the early church felt for developing, developing belief formulas for the people who are going to be baptized that they could uh, specifically profess before they go into the waters of baptism. That's the Apostles' Creed. And, um, and uh, over time, uh, uh, as I said, the Apostles' Creed eventually became uh, uh, more explicit or more elaborated, more, we defined it more, and that became the Nicene Creed. The word creed, by the way, comes from the Latin word credo, meaning I believe. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> the church has been in and out in saying credo or credumus, uh, we believe. Uh, early church always said we believe as a community, and most of you are not old, old enough maybe to remember this, but before 2011, uh, we always uh, said, at least since the Vatican Council II, when we uh, again reformulated the language of the, of the Apostles and Nicene Creed, uh, then, and the Vatican Council happened in 1962 to 1965, we went back to the more ancient formula of the early church and we said, we believe, we as a community believe together. Now, at, at the um, right around 2011, when we reformulated the, the language of celebrating liturgy, our public worship, the mass, the sacraments, the church thought, hmm, uh, we need to challenge people to say that not only do we believe, but they really personally believe what they're saying. So the church went back to, uh, uh, in the Latin translation, credo, which means I believe, and we translate that as I believe. Now, that doesn't mean that I believe alone by myself. It means I believe in communion with the rest of my Christian brothers and sisters who are members of the church. I believe this. I believe this about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and so forth, and the creed. Uh, so, that just gives you a little background about, about what the word, where the word creed comes from, comes from the Latin word credo, I believe. Um, what happened was uh, how we got to the Nicene Creed, uh, guys, was over the first three centuries of Christianity, the church uh, was really developing her theology about what she believed about Jesus in terms of his humanity and his divinity, and also uh, uh, what they believed about the Trinity, about God as being three persons in one God, 
all three persons being this one God, this divine God. And uh, she, she never explicitly, let's put it this way, for the first three centuries, it was never fully defined, but the early uh, the early century theologians were working with it and they had different nuances or ways of perspective perspectives of understanding what we mean by saying Jesus is both divine and human or Jesus is the second person of the Trinity uh, what all this means uh, and uh, by the time the church came to the fourth century, the early part of the 300s, the church was dealing with, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way, she felt the need to define this and be more explicit about it because some she had been dealing with some heresies uh, over the three centuries in which she was trying to hammer out uh, this whole idea of, of Jesus being divine and human and the idea of, of this one God being in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Two of the heresies she was dealing with, one was the Gnostic heresy of the early church. The Gnostic heresy basically denied that Jesus was human, that he was completely spirit, divine. He only looked like a man or kind of had on a man suit, I guess, or a human suit, if you want to uh, use inclusive language. Uh, he, uh, God was not really human. It only looked like it. Uh, and or God never fully became human. And, and this, the church said, this doesn't really express our belief. The, early, the fathers of the church, are the, the leaders of the church, the bishops of the church, so this is not what we really believe, that Jesus only appeared as, as or God, the second person of the Trinity, only appeared as human, and this person we call Jesus. Uh, uh, a, the, the idea the Gnostics had was that evil was bad, matter was bad, uh, evil, uh, and God would never become something that is evil. But then the fathers said, why would God create anything that is intrinsically evil? Matter is not intrinsically evil. Flesh is not intrinsically evil. You, you, all of creation and reality materials, not intrinsically evil. We may be sinners and fallen and broken, but we're not intrinsically evil. Uh, we are intrinsically good. This is that we have misused what God has created and became sinners. We've entered, we have introduced the element of sin in our lives uh, by the way we human beings have behaved. So they wanted to, they wanted to make it clear that we do not believe what the Gnostics believe, uh, denying that Jesus was human. Now, the other, the other heresy they were dealing with was by a priest named Arius. He was from uh, Egypt, I believe if I'm correct, uh, right before the uh, 300s came on the scene, or the early part of the 300s. Uh, and Arius taught that uh, Jesus was not fully God. Uh, uh, I mean, fully divine. Uh, this is why we say in the Nicene Creed, uh, we say uh, God from God, but we not only end there, we say true God from true God, because Arius didn't deny that Jesus was in some way divine, but he was kind of a sub-God, um, um, <clears throat> is what he was. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and he put much more emphasis upon the fact that Jesus was a creation of the Father, uh, as if the Father created him, and, 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 and uh, created this person that we we call Jesus of Nazareth, uh, who we believe has some relationship with God, but he's not God in the sense that God, the Father is God, the true God. Uh, Jesus is only kind of like under God or something like that, kind of a sub-God, if you will. Um, so Arius was uh, denying, in essence, the full divinity of Jesus and, and emphasizing that he was a creature uh, of God, something created. Uh, and the church says at that time, dealing with all, dealing again with trying to redefine what she believes about what Jesus, who Jesus is as being divine and human, and says, this is not what we really believe either. And we need to be more explicit about this and explain it better in the profession of faith that we have. So in the year 325, uh, the emperor Constantine called a consul of the bishops uh, the Emperor Constantine, by the way, is the one who gave Christianity its freedom uh, to be a, a religion in the Roman Empire about the year 311, 312 AD <clears throat> with the Edict of Milan. 
and um, <clears throat> uh, and Constantine felt a responsibility for the protection of the Christian faith, and that there be a unity in the Christian faith also, and that the divisions be stopped that were happening with the heresies that were going on about uh, the teachings of the church. So he called the consul in 325 AD <coughs> of those bishops who could make it to the consul, because you got to remember transportation was not exactly the fastest or quick in those days. It took about three months to get from Spain, one end of the empire, over to the eastern part of the empire, Nicaea, which was in Turkey. So a lot of bishops could not make the consul, but uh, <clears throat> many bishops from the eastern part of the empire did make the consul, and it did have the blessings of the Bishop of Rome at that time. So it's a legitimate early uh, first, considered the first ecumenical, ecumenical being Greek, worldwide consul of the church. And it's at that consul that they hammer out basically what we now call the Nicene Creed uh, and we profess at mass. Another consul called the Consul of Constantinople, later on Constantinople I, even refined this Nicene Creed further in terms of what we believe about the Holy Spirit uh, in that third section of the creed. Um, and sometimes you will hear the creed called the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. But basically the framework of the creed was worked out at the Council of Nicaea, where we defined our belief of Jesus as being fully human and fully divine. It's a mystery we don't completely understand how, how God can be uh, how this how this person we call Jesus of Nazareth can be fully human and yet fully divine at the same time. But it's a mystery we believe in, and God can work mysteries beyond our understanding. He God lives in a realm of eternity, uh, which is uh, beyond anything we can understand or even imagine. Uh, if God can create a universe of 100 billion galaxies, he can certainly be able to bring about uh, a, a reality that is fully human and fully divine when God himself decides to become flesh in human flesh. So the creed tries to affirm then that, that <clears throat> uh, Jesus is indeed divine. That is the Nicene Creed, spelling it out more. Jesus is divine. He but he is begotten. He is not created. That means that's his relationship with God. It's a begotten relationship. It doesn't exist in time. It always was. The Trinity always was and always, and but that's uh, always was and is a perfect creation. It is a perfect reality, not creation, but God is a perfect reality. Uh, who never had a beginning, will never have an end. And that relationship between the Father and the Son is like uh, it's, a, it's a begotten relation. In other words, the son participates or receives his life from the father, but it had no beginning. It always was in that relationship. It always was. And uh, he's begotten, not created. He's, <clears throat> he's with the father before all ages, and he's God from God, light for light, but he's not just some God from, not like a sub-God. So that's why we say true God, for he's the true, fully God as the father is. Uh, we profess. Uh, fully divine, completely divine. The Holy Spirit is completely divine also. This is why we say in the third part of the creed, we believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son. That means he, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is completely fully divine as the Father and Son are. They all share completely and fully in the, divine, in, in the divinity of what the Godhead is all about. And that's a good way to picture God as a Godhead, of since the three persons are involved. All three persons participate equally in the Godhead, the divinity, which makes them fully one God. They operate with one, one mind is not entirely correct. It's just no language. We're, our, our language is always at at a very, it's out of poverty and able to express what who God really is. We're always speaking by analogy about God because we can never fully express it in human language, no matter what language you're talking about, whether it be Spanish, English, French, German, you know, Chinese, whatever, you're not going to be able to fully grasp the mystery that is God by language. It's language is too is it is exists in a state of poverty in relationship to uh to God. Um <clears throat> And uh, they to emphasize that Jesus is indeed 
one God, a true God from true God. They say uh, one in being, where they use the word consubstantial, which means one in being, which we, that, those are the words we used before 2011, one in being. But consubstantial means of the same substance. They're of the same divine substance. All three persons are. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, that's where our Nicene Creed comes from, is basically from the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Uh, and as I said, refined again by the Council of Const Const uh, Constant uh, Constantinople, I think it was around 380, 381, if I remember correctly, off the top of my head. Um, but anyway, that is the profession of faith we use at the Mass, that more elaborate faith, realizing that it has its roots in the Apostles' Creed, which goes back to the second century, which is the baptismal creed of the early church. Okay, um, let's see here now. Uh, as, as Catholics, um, uh, I think it's important to realize that uh, we are called to, uh, uh, that the creed is more than just words. Uh, it's, it, it tends to express that which we believe, those articles of faith, there are 12 in there basically, uh, articles of faith, uh, and that we are called to as confirmed Catholics that means you become a full member of the Catholic Church. Confirmation is the last anointing of the baptism in the Western Church. That is the church, the Roman Catholic Church. We always have confirmation usually done in relationship to the head of the local church, that is the bishop. So the bishop will have some word in your being a baptized Christian confirming that. So he's confirming you in your faith. It's what you're doing that you began with when you were baptized. And as confirmed Catholics, full members of the church, uh, then we are invited uh, and called upon uh, to uh, express this faith from our whole heart and defend this faith. Uh, and uh, we have a deeper responsibility now being a full member of the church. We've taken this faith on. We say, I believe. This is what you're doing when you, when you become confirmed. You're saying, I do believe everything that's here in the Nicene Creed. Uh, another thing to remember, as I mentioned uh, uh, somewhat earlier here, I beliefs can, in a certain sense, change, but at their core, they don't. Uh, for instance, we have the Nicene Creed, but the Nicene Creed are like like guardrails, saying you can't go over these guardrails. And the and when you do theology or when you try to define even further what you believe, these elements have to be omitted, and you can do your thinking within the framework of these twelve articles that we uh, that we say we believe. Um, for instance, this is what theology down through the ages, the church is 2,000 years old, is all about trying to gain further insights into what we believe and how uh, we can become uh, 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 more full in implementing what Jesus teaches and what our creed says we believe. Uh, for we will then down through the ages gain deeper insights and maybe have different perspectives on what what we on how we believe Jesus to be God or be man or be part of the or, or be the second person of the Trinity. How do you define this even further in more specific theological language or philosophical language? Uh, and we gain deeper insights down through the ages. So realize that uh, that is that uh, the core beliefs don't change. We're not going to throw out the creed, in other words, but we may have deeper insights about what we're saying as the Holy Spirit guides us. As Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I will send you the Holy Spirit and he will guide you to all truth. This will happen over the ages as the church fulfills her mission to be the, uh, the church in the world. And that opens me up then to talk about the four marks of the church, uh, which are uh, uh, <clears throat> de uh, uh, delineated in, the th in that third part of the creed where we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And then I say, I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Those are the four marks of the church, the one, the holy, the
the Catholic, the apostolic, you know, the four marks, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. This is what we believe about the church. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, as we, as I talk about these four marks of the church uh, that we say we believe about the church that are, are enumerated here in the Nicene Creed, uh, some key terms I want you to keep in mind and think about. One is apostolic succession. You know, we say that we believe in the apostolic, one holy Catholic apostolic. Apostolic succession basically uh, means the handing on of the faith uh, that who, ha, who ha, is true to the apostolic faith that the apostles gave us, the foundational faith of the very early church, who is true to that. That's apostolic succession. But apostolic succession also includes uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the teaching office of the church that has been handed on from the apostles uh, and then uh, <clears throat> handed on to the local leaders of the church, that of the churches they established, like St. Paul established various churches in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Macedonia, uh, in other area, area, other towns and, and cities and places in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. These churches that the apostles established, they handed on to their, their authority to those who they put in charge of those churches or helped to put in charge of those churches with the uh, cooperation of the, of the local Christians who, of the church that they established. These were known as the uh, those local uh, teaching authorities were the uh, what were called the overseers and presbyters of the church. Overseers is a Greek word. It, it's episkopos, where we get the word episcopal. Episkopos means overseer. And that's what we call the bishop today. And then presbyter means an elder of the church. These were, uh, they formed a consul with the, the overseer that oversaw saw the local church. And the presbyters, the elders uh, became eventually called what we call the the priest of the church. That's myself. My official title is that of presbyter. I'm an elder of the church. I got ordained an elder at 26 years old, even though I wasn't chronologically an elder, but I was supposed to be by wisdom, insight, and knowledge, an elder able to help guide the church. But anyway, that's apostolic succession has to do with the handing on of the faith, living uh, the faith that is that you uh, are, are true to the faith that was given to us at, at the foundation of the church, and that the authority that comes from the teaching office of the church down through those who have been what we call ordained as teaching offices handed down through the sacrament of holy orders, uh, which I'm sure you will talk about at some point during your uh uh, preparation for confirmation. Also, uh, the other other terms are magisterium. Magisterium comes from the uh, Latin word magister. Uh, magister means teacher. That's just the teaching office of the church. It includes the uh, Bishop of Rome, uh, who we consider to be the successor of Peter. It uh, includes all the bishops who we consider to be the successor of the apostles again and their teaching authority. It includes the priests who are uh, put in place by those who are successors of the apostles, the presbyters, the priests of the church. It includes even the theologians and those who teach the faith in the church. That's part of the teaching authority of the church also. Uh, the theologians guide us in the development of our faith. Uh, theologians work basically in universities and colleges, uh, 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 teaching uh, uh, about God. Theology is, is a word that means comes from two Greek words, theos and logos, meaning words about God. Okay, so that's all part of the teaching office of the church. And to some extent, all Christians who are baptized uh, have a responsibility of exercising the magisterium or teaching office of the church and handing on the faith. You know, Carrie Weibel does that as, as the youth minister. She takes on that teaching office of the church of handing on the faith. DREs, directors of religious education, do that. Parents do that in their home. Each home is a little church in Latin ecclesiola where the parents are the head of that church and they're responsible for handing on the faith to those children they bring into the world. The other you might want to keep in mind, the other term is deposit of faith. 
The deposit of faith is that heritage of sacred scripture. Uh, the scriptures are the word of God, the sacred scriptures, the very word of God. Uh, in, let's put it this way. It's the inspired word of God, okay? Uh, the very word of God is Jesus Christ. The scriptures are the inspired word of God uh, through human authors uh, and then sacred tradition, the tradition of the church over the past 2,000 years, and really probably going back further than that, if we count our roots going back to the time of Abraham, we're talking about another 5,000 years uh, with the, our roots being in the Jewish faith. Uh, Christianity is. You need to keep that in mind. It's a long tradition. And tradition is a developing thing uh, which we gain new insight and we may develop new practices and different ways of teaching the faith or understanding uh, what we mean by the uh, faith that we teach, uh, the deposit of faith. We don't throw anything out, so to speak. Uh, the Catholic Church doesn't, since we believe in tradition and we don't, and we believe that the Holy Spirit will never guide us to go down a wrong path in terms of our tradition. Um, it, <clears throat> so things like the rosary, uh, 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 prayers that we develop down through the time. I mean, none of these are in Scripture, but they, came, they were developed over time uh, uh, in our tradition that came about crucifixes on the wall, the way we reserve the Eucharist in the tabernacle. Those weren't never established. You don't see anything about those in Scripture or the early apostles talking about any of those things because they developed over time, but that doesn't mean they're, they're, they're not part, they don't have their roots in scripture and our beliefs about the real presence of Jesus, our belief about prayer, our belief about the Blessed Mother and being able uh, to ask the mother, Blessed Mother to, uh, to intercede for us in prayer. All that has roots in scripture, but uh, out of that develops uh, uh, traditions down through the age. And some things we may emphasize more at one time than at, at others. That's just depending upon what the, what the church is dealing with, the issues the church is dealing with at the time. Okay. Um, the, um, um, let's talk about the four marks a little more specifically. Uh, again, those four marks, one holy Catholic and apostolic church, let's talk about one. One means that the church is one. We believe in one holy Catholic an apostolic church. It talks, it's about the unity of the church. It's really only one church of Jesus Christ. And I know you see many Christian denominations. You see, besides Roman Catholic, you see Orthodox, you see uh, <clears throat> Episcopalians, Methodists, uh, Baptists, Presbyterians, and Lutherans, and so forth and so on, many Christian denominations, uh, you know. Uh, and that doesn't mean there's a whole, there's, there's different churches. What we believe and what the Catholic Church believes is that we all participate in that one church of Jesus Christ, though some of us may participate in that one church of Jesus Christ more fully than those other churches, and more union than what that one church is, let's put it that way. We believe as Catholics, since we can trace our roots all the way back, uh, to the foundation with Jesus and the apostles uh, in the first century, we believe we Roman Catholics especially uh, participate in the fullness of what the church of Jesus Christ is all about. In other words, the Roman Catholic church is fully church. She la the Catholic church lacks nothing in being and living out being the one church of Jesus Christ. The model for our unity and the model for our oneness is the Trinity, again, one God, uh, three, one. Uh, e pluribus unum, that's the model of the United States, but it's a Latin model, it means out of many, one. Uh, <clears throat> and that's what we believe, out of many, one. There's only one faith, and we all approximate participating in that faith by degrees, but there's only one faith that Jesus established. There's only one baptism for salvation, and we all can participate in that baptism as it is, is defined by the tradition of church, what baptism is. That one baptism, only one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all, <clears throat> and one Lord Jesus Christ. 
Uh, there's no, not many lords. There's only one Lord, Jesus Christ. Lord comes from a Greek word, kyrios, uh, meaning uh, uh, the, 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 uh, basically the one who um, is the divine one, the one who is sent to bring us salvation, um, who, is, who shows us the way, the Lord of life and death. That is Jesus. There's only one. So one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. And of course, only one Holy Spirit also that comes from, uh, that is God, that is the God's spirit that is sent forth into the world. So our model for our unity is the Trinity, <clears throat> that we try to be one even though we're many. Um, so, and, and as I said, we believe that the Roman Catholic Church expresses this unity uh, in its fullest way uh, through, uh, as, uh, uh, by maintaining everything that we have been given in both our in in both uh, what Jesus has given us and in, in his teachings that we have in the scriptures and in the traditions we have developed down through the ages as as the church of Christ <clears throat> okay um, now but you know again you uh, you do see as I said you so you see many, many other denominations, Christian denominations, but each of those denominations participate more or less fully in the one church of Jesus Christ. In other words, they are not all fully church because they're missing some element of what church is all about, what we believe church is all about. Uh, there were two major divisions of Christianity. We just mentioned that in the development of the Nicene Creed, they were dealing with some heresies, the Gnostic heresy, and the, the Arian heresy, the early churches, a couple of them. But there were many small divisions like that in the early church and throughout the church down through the ages that were small and they dissipated or went away in one way, form, or another. But there have been two major uh, divisions in Christianity that still affect us today. The first major split in Christianity happened in 1054 AD between the Church of the East, what we call the Orthodox Church, and the Church of the West, what came to be called the Catholic Church, and later on with the moniker Roman Catholic Church. That was in the year 1054 AD. <clears throat> there were always cultural uh, differences, uh, ethnic differences, uh, historical maybe differences, uh, and may pol certainly political differences, between the Church of the East and the Church of the West of the Roman Empire. Uh, it was always kind of a, a uneasy relationship uh, for the first thousand years of Christianity. And unfortunately it got worse over time and fault lays on both sides, both the Church of the West, what we know as ourselves as the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of the East. And in the year 1054 AD that the split became between East and West became pretty final, uh, where the, the Bishop of Rome excommunicated the whole church of the East uh, and, the, our, our, and the Archbishop or, or Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicated the whole church of the West. We believe, and Vatican Council II, the years that happened 1062, 10, I mean 1062, I mean 1962 to 1964, the Vatican Council states that the Eastern churches are our brothers and sisters fully in the faith. They possess fully what church is all about. The only thing, the sacraments, the scriptures, everything. The, uh, they have uh, the apostolic succession. They never get, that never broke down in the Eastern church. Their bishops are just as much successors of the apostles as the bishops of the church of the West, the Roman Catholic church. And they are fully churches. We call them sister churches and we recognize the Eastern church as sister churches, but they're not in full union with us because they are missing that element of relationship with the Bishop of Rome, who we believe to be the successor of Peter in his role uh, as uh, <clears throat> Peter's role as maintaining, being the prime teacher of all of, all of uh, Christianity. Uh, that, that was probably one of the major reasons for the division was our differences of understanding what the role of Peter was. Uh, and not just Peter himself personally, but the, they mean by Peter, the Bishop of Rome. What is his role, you know, in union of the church? Is it an administrative role? 
there's a, a leadership role that's different than administrative. Uh, and, and it's gone different ways down through history of understanding the role of the Bishop of Rome. Um, the West went one way in understanding what that role of the Bishop of Rome was. East went a different way of understanding that role, what the Bishop of Rome was. And But we see that since they gave up any kind of relationship with the Bishop of Rome, the churches of the East, we see them as missing that element that makes them as full uh, a representative of the Church of Christ in the world as the Western Church, that is the Roman Catholic Church in the world. The other major <clears throat> division uh, in Christianity happened in the Western Church, didn't happen in the Eastern Church, happened in the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church in 1517 with the Protestant Reformation. And this is why you see so many uh, different denominations in the Western world, you know, as I just mentioned, uh, churches as Baptists, as Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutherans, uh, many in this country, Pentecostal churches, and, uh, and uh, what they would call themselves evangelical Christians or, or evangelical churches, you know. Uh, <clears throat> It just, it just, once the Protestant Reformation happened in 1517, it kind of blossomed from there or just proliferated from there, so to speak, where Christianity in the Protestant world kept on dividing and dividing and dividing. Protestant world, uh, Protestant is a word that means protest. It happened in 1517, beginning with Martin Luther, who was a Roman Catholic priest in Germany. Uh, <clears throat> expressing some disagreements with the way uh, that some of the teachings of the church had been presented at that time uh, and had some serious disagreements with some real bad corruption in the church at that time also. So the, the, the Roman Catholic Church is, is not, uh, <clears throat> is, is not, its hands are not clean uh, when it comes to the Protestant Reformation. There are fault on both sides for the divisions you see in Christianity right now. Um, but Martin Luther, uh, who was a priest of the Roman Catholic Church, as I said, from Germany, uh, he uh, 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 expressed many differences with the way in which Christianity was being taught or presented, the way the church was presenting scriptures or understanding salvation, and especially in the area of what was called indulgences. And I can't really get into that right now. Uh, you would have to study church history uh, to find out, uh, to understand that better. But nonetheless, that's when it began in 1517 and has flowered ever since, or, or blossomed ever since. That, that proliferated, let's put it, that's a better word, proliferated. You know, it wasn't blossoming into something beautiful. Uh, division is never beautiful. Uh, but eventually in the 19th century, that is the 1800s, uh, and the, I mean, excuse me, the 19th century, which is the 1900s, I made a mistake there. It's not the 18th, that's, that's the, 18, 18, uh, yes, that the 19th century is the 1800s. I'm getting confused in my old age. Um, 1700s is 18th century, 19, uh, 1800s is, is the 19th century, and of course, the uh, uh, 20th <clears throat> century is the 1900s, which we just got out of, and now we're in the 21st century. But during the 1800s, the late 1800s, the 19th century, um, we, um, uh, a movement began in Christianity, first in the Protestant world, to try to unite Christians in some way, to try to head somewhere we can get at some form of unity, once again, of Christianity, all of Christianity, including the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics. This movement is called the ecumenical movement. It's a Greek word meaning worldwide. And the Roman Catholic Church during Vatican Council II, again, 1962 to 1965, under Pope John uh, the 23rd and Pope Paul the sixth uh, <clears throat> uh, gave a <clears throat> a great emphasis on the Roman Catholic Church getting involved in the ecumenical movement. Not all Protestant churches are involved in the ecumenical movement, especially those Protestants who believe they have the only way to truth and everybody else is going to hell, so to speak. Uh, they don't want to get involved with the ecumenical movement. <clears throat> But the Catholics very much did want to with Vatican Council II, Pope John wanted to, 
Paul VI wanted to, and we are very much involved, the Roman Catholic Church and the ecumenical movement with the mainline Protestant bodies uh, who are involved with the worldwide ecumenical movement of trying to work for unity in Christianity once again. So we are working for it. It may take us a while because we've been divided uh, since 1517. And the division between East and West has been since 1054. We're working on that unity also. The Pope and the Patriarch, the Patriarch of Constantinople meet quite often and are quite, uh, and are quite uh, <clears throat> open to each other and very friendly in their relationships with each other. Um, let's move on to Holy. Holy is probably, might be a hard, uh, a more difficult concept to grasp since the church is full of sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. He calls sinners. Jesus only has sinners to work with to become members of his church. So we ask the question, how can the church be holy if she's full of a bunch of sinners? And some of them are pretty big sinners sometimes. Well, you know, it, it, it's not the perfect who need the church. It's sinners who need the church to help us with, on the way to salvation. We're the ones that need the church. So the church is always going to be full of people who are personally sinners. That doesn't mean the church itself as an institution is, as, is not holy because she has sinners. Uh, the church is uh, holy because of Jesus makes her holy. The church is the body of Jesus. It is he who makes the church holy. He is the church. We are members and participation in his life. We have got to remember by virtue of our baptism. It is he who makes the church holy. His life, his resurrected life through the power of the Holy Spirit that makes the church holy. Uh, and our purpose then as individual Christians, as individual members of this one body, we call the church, the body of Christ, Jesus operates and lives through us. Our purpose then is to uh, <clears throat> strive for that holiness in our own lives as best as we can. Again, going back to Vatican Council II, Vatican Council Petru uh, proclaimed that holiness is the vocation of every Christian. It's not the uh, a vocation only of priests or nuns or monks or brothers, uh, or sisters, or the ordained of any kind. It's all of our, all of our vocation as baptized Christians is to aim for holiness. And holiness means to live out fully uh, the best we can, the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, his message, his life, live out his life as best as we can. And it has nothing to do with looking saintly or looking pietistic or or whatever, but it does involve prayer. We have to pray. Pray is communication with God and with the communion of saints. It's communication. We, we want to be in communion. This helps us grow in holiness, but we have to realize that our holiness is, is, is our vocation uh, as all uh, uh, of all Christians, and that we are called to this holiness uh, by our baptism, uh, by uh, taking on this mission of the church through our baptism. And again, realizing that even though the church is has sinners, we're all, no one's not a sinner, not even the Pope. We all commit sins and do things wrong. We all have room to grow and become more Christ-like. Uh, the church is holy by virtue of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, which makes it holy. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and realize that Jesus has given us aids to grow in this holiness. Uh, one, we have the scriptures, which eventually, uh, the New Testament eventually became developed in the early church. We always have the Old Testament when the church began. That was already on the scene, what we call the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew scriptures, the first part of the Bible. <clears throat> we have the scriptures and we have the sacraments that we believe uh, that Jesus gives us on a constant basis. Those seven sacraments that we have of of baptism, of confirmation, of, of Eucharist, you know, and of the sacrament of reconciliation, and uh, the sacrament of holy orders, and the sacrament of marriage, and the, and the sacrament of the sick. These are, these are signs, physical, real signs in the world that let us know that we are, by participating in these signs, fully and with, a, and with our full mind and 
and and self, we can't we are growing in holiness uh, as individuals into this body of Christ. Uh, so that's what we mean when we call the church holiness. It's not the, has to do with individual holiness of the members of the church, but with the holiness that Jesus and the Holy Spirit bestow upon the church because it is a divine institution. The church is not a human institution. It is, is Jesus and the Spirit. They will always be fully holy. And they what constitutes the holiness of the church to which all of us individually strive. Also, the church is uh, called Catholic. Uh, that'll be the third uh, mark that we'll talk about. Uh, Catholic um, basically is a Greek word meaning universal. Um, uh, that basically means uh, that the church is worldwide or is meant to be worldwide. The church salvation is for everybody. Let's put it that way. It certainly has its roots in scripture. Uh, examples are given in the gospel of Matthew with the story of the Magi. The Magi are Gentiles. They're not part of the Israelites, the chosen people of God at the time, which means that what's being stated here is that the good news, the gospel, salvation God offers to everyone, including those who are not, have not historically been part of the chosen people of God, the Israelites. The church, in other words, is Catholic, is universal, and she is charged by Jesus to preach this message to the whole world. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, go and baptize all the nations, baptize all the nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He sends them forth to all the nations of the world, Jesus does. That is the apostles and the church down through the ages. Uh, <clears throat> uh, therefore, since the church is Catholic and universal, uh, her message is for the whole world. Salvation is for the whole world. That means that all peoples, in a certain sense, have a relationship to Christianity, uh, the broader church, all, all of Christianity, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant. Uh, all all of the world has a relationship to Christianity because Christianity, the church of Jesus Christ, is meant to be uh, or Jesus sends the church into the world to be the means of salvation for the world. Uh, so that means that those uh, <clears throat> that means that those who are um, uh, who certainly uh, are uh, in union with us in baptism, all of our Christian brothers and sisters, uh, and are in union with us in the creed. All Christians profess the Nicene Creed, whether it be Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant. Uh, have and our union with us in, in some of the sacraments and in in the way in apostolic succession, um, all Christians uh, share in uh, this uh, Catholic universality of the church, and uh, <clears throat> in some way, shape, or form. And as I said before, some more uh, in union with what the Church of Jesus Christ is all about, and some in. Uh, some Christians and less union. That is the Orthodox and the Protestants, we at least from our Catholic belief in terms of what we believe the whole church is all about. But we also believe our Jewish brothers and sisters are linked with the church because of the fact our Jewish brothers and sisters, as Pope John Paul II calls them, are elder brothers. So our elder brothers and sisters, they are, Judaism is the mother of Christianity. It's out of Judaism that Christianity flowers and bursts forth through Jesus, Jesus himself being a Jew. Uh, Jesus, is, in that sense, is not a Christian. He, we are the Christians. We're his followers. Uh, he's the one that provided the teachings, and we and we followed him. And, and we eventually blossom forth and to his body in the world that he sends us in the world to do, as you heard, as I just mentioned, when he said, go to all the world and baptize all the name, that is preach and live the good news. And, and those who accept it, bring them into your uh, communion of faith by baptizing them into the faith. That is baptizing everybody into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, participating in his life of holiness. Also, we believe that... Um, <clears throat> that those people who uh, are non-Christians uh, or those people um, uh, who, who may, uh, may not even be monotheistic, that is, belief in one God, 
have a relationship to the Catholic Church in some way, shape, or form. Vatican Council too, again, is 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 uh, 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 is very prominent in in, uh, in getting Catholics to understand that all of us have a relationship to God in one way, shape, or form. And the Catholic Church sees whatever is good and true in whatever religion we're talking about. Uh, it could be the Islamic religion, for sure, the Muslims. They're one of the three Abrahamic faiths. There's three Abrahamic faiths that are founded on our father Abraham. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam claim, all claim Abraham as their father in faith. All of these that believe in the one God, uh, we may believe different things about that, what, who we believe that one God to be, but we all believe in that one God of Abraham. And we are certainly, they, for, they are related to the Catholic Church in, in, and participate in some ways in the means of salvation, uh, even non-Christian religions, uh, even, though, <coughs> uh, even though they may not be Christians as far as that goes. In other words, they're kind of, what we call those who who uh, are who are living their life the best they can and trying to find the follow the will of God the best they can trying to do the good the best they see how they are in a sense anonymous Christians you know whether they know that know it or not you know that's what G salvation is through Jesus Christ uh, no matter what religion you're talking about and God can work through. Uh, even though in limited ways people have limited themselves and been able to relate back to God, God can work through any way that uh, man or humankind establishes, you know. So you got to be careful you ever hear that phrase outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. That's, <clears throat> you have to understand that in the right way. It means that uh, it's Catholic Church is the one through which salvation is brought into the world because the Catholic Church participates fully in what the Church of Jesus Christ is all about, and Jesus Christ works to bring salvation to the world through his church. That is correct. But that church touches everybody in the world in one way, shape, or form. Uh, we're all in relationship with the Catholic Church, and uh, more in unity with that church and less in unity with that church, depending upon where we stand and our, or, or the belief system out of which we operate. <clears throat> So, but the bottom line is that the Catholic Church is universal and meant for all, and for all races, all genders, all ages, all languages, all social status, and all beliefs, the Catholic Church <clears throat> is universal. That's why we call it Catholic, universal. Finally, the fourth mark of the church is that of ap apostolic, and we've already mentioned something about that. As apostolic because our foundation is upon the apostles of the church, which includes the 12 apostles that Jesus called, but also other apostles who were not part of the 12. Uh, St. Paul was an apostle, St. Barnabas was an apostle, but they were not members of the 12, the original 12 apostles. Apostle in the early church was a ministry, a, a specific ministry in the early church, much like bishop and priest today. The, 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 uh, the quality or the uh, or the uh, uh, <clears throat> the requirements for being an apostle basically were yet you had to have an experience of the risen Jesus at that time. These were the people who had the direct experience of the risen Jesus. Remember, Paul had that direct experience of the risen Jesus on the way to Damascus when he's going to persecute Christians, and he encountered the risen Christ, who in a certain sense shocked him into becoming an apostle for this faith that he was persecuting. Eventually, that ministry kind of died out, I guess you could say, the specific ministry of apostle and the, and the ministry that the apostles had of, of teaching, that teaching authority, devolved upon the leaders of the local church communities, which eventually became the priest, or a uh, better way to put it would be the bishops first, who are the overseers and the priests who are the presbyters, and including deacons. Uh, deacons were established even before priests. Deacons, a Greek word meaning uh, uh, being of service, a servant. Because uh, if you remember in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the, uh, uh, the apostles established a diaconate or ministry of service first uh, before uh, a ministry of eldership or being members of a council that runs a local church, that'd be the presbyters, the elders. <clears throat> but anyway, apostolic means we have our foundation 
in the early apostles of the church, and that that authority and that uh, leadership authority and that teaching authority is passed down through what we call the sacrament of orders, or by the laying on of hands, where the bishop, the overseer, intends to pass on uh, teaching authority uh, and uh, uh, sanctifying authority uh, and, and guiding authority uh, to others to lead the church uh, or help him in the leading of the church in the, in the local area or, or in the ordaining of other bishops to take over the leadership of a, another local church, whatever local church that might be. A local church and a Catholic church is the diocese. Uh, parishes participate in what the local church is. Uh, a parish is, is, strictly speaking, not a church because uh, church, it, it, for a Catholic perspective, has to include the fullness of, of the ministry, which includes bishops, priests, deacons, and then all the people themselves, uh, with those involved in consecrated life, the religious life, and those who are lay people. All that has to be present for there to be called a church. So it's, it's the diocese, is the church, and parishes are are divisions of that church so that the bishop can have a way of administering that church as he can't be everywhere at once. Therefore, he sends out the presbyters, that is the priest to uh, head up these parishes, uh, so to speak, to be leaders, these shepherds, these parishes, a better way to put it. Another way I mentioned of being apostolic is that of the faith itself, that the handing on of the apostolic faith that is rooted in the apostles who laid the foundation for the early church. We call this the deposit of faith. Doesn't mean the deposit of faith we have now is, is I, it, it's not changed, but it's, I don't say you can see it's added to, but it has grown in terms of this understanding. The deposit of faith because of tradition in the church for the last 2000 years is much larger than what the apostles originally handed on through greater insight, greater study, greater reflection on the scriptures, great, greater knowledge that we gain about our relationship with God. And this is the deposit of faith and is handed on uh, through those who uh, participate in the ministry of leadership by apostolic succession. And we call the teaching authority of the church the magisterium. And I already talked about the magisterium, how uh, even we who, even those who are lay people in a very real way participate in the magisterium of the church also. In the magisterium or the apostolic succession, we consider the Pope to be important. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church consider that as one of the elements of what the fullness of church is all about, that you have to be in union with the Bishop of Rome who succeeds to Peter's ministry. <clears throat> you say, what is Peter's ministry? Well, Peter's ministry was that of one of trying to maintain unity in the church, helping the church remain one. It's called the ministry of primacy. He had the primary responsibility for seeing over the teaching of the faith. Uh, it's also called the ministry of charity for the sake of service to all the churches. That is what we call diocese today, all the churches, you know, and, 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 and his ministry was primary in doing this. And we consider the Bishop of Rome to succeed. And you say, why is the Bishop, why did not some other bishops succeed to the role of Peter? Basically because both Peter and Paul, the two primary apostles of the early church, uh, for the growth of the church, the two primary missionary apostles, Peter and Paul, ended their ministry in Rome. That's where they uh, uh, spent their last days preaching, their last days of helping to form the Christian community, the last days of leading the Christian community were in Rome, and they died in Rome. And uh, after them, as I said, the, uh, there were no more apostles after the apostles died out, there were no more apostles on the scene. So the Bishop of Rome, the Church of Rome, uh, because it has apostolic foundations and Peter and Paul, the two chief apostles, always considered that the, that the Episcopos, the overseer of the Church of Rome, succeeded, and even the Church of Rome itself in a very real extent, succeeded to the role of Peter in leading the other churches and maintaining unity in the a Catholic church throughout the world, whether it be the church of the East or the West. And as I said, the East and the West had different ideas on how that's kind of going to be exercised. Uh, <clears throat> one more reflection on the role of the apostles, since we believe in apostolic foundation. Uh, as I said, the apostles 
as a specific ministry eventually died off on the scene. And that role was in a very real and specific way taken over by the leaders of the local church, the Episcopals, the overseer, the bishop, and the presbyters, the priests. Um, but in a, the word apostle means to be sent. The word disciple means the one that means a person who's in the process of learning, a student, if you will. Who and our our learning is about the learning of the gospel, the learning of Jesus' teachings, the learnings of of the ways and and the faith of the church. And and <clears throat> once we learn all of that, or in the we're, I mean, we never learn at all, but we're always trying to learn, increase our knowledge, and increase our insight. But once we are comfortable enough with that, then we are charged to, in that sense, for ourselves, every one of us, to fulfill that apostolic role where Jesus says, go and, and proclaim the gospel to all the nations of the world. We all, in that sense, the ministry of apostle has devolved upon the whole church. All of us have the responsibility uh, of, of being sent, uh, going forth and proclaiming the good news. In baptism, Jesus calls us and forms us into his body, the church, and <clears throat> in the sacrament of the Eucharist specifically, Jesus sends us forth then, strengthened by his life that we received in baptism through the Eucharist, to go and proclaim the good news to all the church. This is what the dismissal is at the end of Mass, the old Latin dismissal that we had, that we used, when the Mass was in Latin, most of you would say, what well, it was? Yes, before Vatican Council II, it was still celebrated in Latin. Um, and uh, the, the old Latin was ite misa es. Misa is where, the, where we get the word mission from. We're on mission. Uh, it, it means go, uh, basically go, you are sent on mission. You are sent on mission to go out and live and proclaim the good news to the world as Jesus did at the end of Matthew's gospel with his apostles and his disciples. And that ends my presentation. I hope I have not uh, uh, been too long-winded. I hope I've given you some food for thought. Uh, some, I hope you learned something. Uh, I may not be the greatest or the best or the perfect teacher in the world. I certainly have enthusiasm for what I preach uh, or what I teach and certainly what I believe as a Catholic Christian. And I, uh, it's, 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 it's a great treasure, and I'm always happy to try to hand it on. And I hope you are also, once you become confirmed and, and do what you can to be a faithful witnesses uh, and living members of the body of Christ. So thank you.